in back in 2001, I joined the military to get money for school. And, you know, the military is its own thing, but September 11th happened. And then I was immediately deployed right after September 11th. And I was in the Middle East at Al Ubeed Air Base in Doha, Qatar. And it was the bear base. It was at my 19. It was my first time out of the country. And I remember wanting to cry and I needed some privacy. So I took some sheets and I hung it from the top of my tent and I made three sheet walls. And that was the first space I ever created. And I bawled like a baby for 15 minutes. And I just remembered that space. It healed me. It comforted me. It brought me solace. And I would deploy four more times um, over the course of the war. And every time I would have to create these spaces for myself. And then I got out of the military, like, I, I want to do this thing where I create spaces for people that brings them comfort and healing. And it led me to interior design. Fast forward to me starting Determined by Design. And the first project I did was a nonprofit project for domestic violence survivors. And we, I walk in there, I'm ready to say, I'm an interior designer, I'm gonna make your spaces better. And these women looked at me like, one, we don't need this. And two, it the narrative just kept shifting from we don't need this to, oh my God, someone would do this for us. I thought this type of thing was only accessible on TV. Is this a career field that I can do? And when the space, when we finished, right, everyone loves the big reveal. It's pretty, but the woman said to me, Miss Kia, when I walked into this room, I realized change was possible for me. And right then I knew the people who need access to well-designed spaces the most, they don't know they don't have it, they don't know they need it, and they don't have an advocate. And I built my business around being that advocate. And that's what keeps me going. Um, and it just goes back full circle to my military career where I just remember so clear the power of, of space and if I didn't know, and if I had to go all the way to war to get there, what's happening in communities right right in my backyard? And how can I help them um, find beauty in their spaces? So for people who don't know what design equity is, mm -hmm. what is that all about? So I think people often hear, you tell someone you're an interior designer and they say, oh my God, I love HGTV. Could you come to my home? And they think of it as this uh, luxury service. And design equity is saying, no, interior design is not a luxury for a few, but a standard for all. So the design equity is advocating for those people and those communities who often get overlooked um, when you hear phrases like, it's too nice for this demographic. These people don't need this level of design, aesthetic, and beauty in their home. And it really shines a light a lot on affordable and low income housing. Can you give me some examples of what inequities look like in design? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. One is property management and leasing, you know, staff. They always say we need to have our eyes on the door. You see this kind of pan octagon leasing window where it's reminiscent of a prison. And I think people don't realize that's a harsh visual to walk into the front door of your home. So we have to walk our developers and property management teams back and say, hey guys, yes, I understand there's a security need, but there's also a level of dignity you need to provide to these residents. What is, what is another example? So this is on, um, you know, you look at a lot of market rate buildings, apartments, and you walk into these lobbies and they're kind of like hotels, it's like an amenity. A lot of times in affordable housing, we'll hear no soft seating in the common areas. And I'm like, wait, what? Why? These people will tear it up. They'll have sex on this furniture. You know, it doesn't last long. You're automatically saying, again, because they're poor, you don't want them to hang out. If you give them anything nice, they will tear it up. And I think that's a disservice. I think everyone deserves access to beauty, softness. That's not a luxury. That's a standard. Does this become a race issue at some point? If you look at any major metropolitan area, right, and who's in affordable housing, it's predominantly minorities. If we were in middle America and it was predominantly white people, I would be advocating for the same thing, right? Uh, but I think if you just look at the, make, the makeup um, and the statistics on affordable housing, it is people of color. We also work with a lot of small business owners. We worked with um, 
Jasmine Jones and Dr. Regina Hampton in um, the design of Cherry Blossom Intimates. It's a boutique lingerie store for breast cancer survivors in Maryland and specifically women of color. And they explained to me the indignified experience that sometimes breast cancer survivors had to go through to get fitted for their prostheses. And right there, I was like, oh, there's a demographic of a person, a demographic that's not having an interior experience that up uplifts them. So I love that project because one, we got to work with a small business owner. Two, we were able to elevate that experience for a demographic who normally didn't get it. So I think it's not just that determined by design does housing, but how do we give elevated experiences to, to disenfranchise people in communities? That's what we want to do. Those are the types of projects we want to work on day in and day out.